Inside the Magic, show number 369 for April 29th, 2012. It is Sunday, April 29th, 2012. This is show 369 of Inside the Magic. And as always, I'm your host, Ricky Briganti. We have a show uh, simply packed with Disney and theme park news this week. I know I say that every week, but uh, this has been a particularly busy week. So uh, we're just going to get right into it. But before we get to all of that, of course, as I do every week, I do want to invite you to visit our website over at InsideTheMagic.net. There you'll find all of our podcasts, videos, photos, news, articles, and plenty more. And if you ever have any news, tips, questions, comments of your own, you can email them to me at ricky at insidethemagic.net, or you can call and leave a message at 407-494-4ITM. That's 4486. And now, let's get on with the show. This week's episode of Inside the Magic is brought to you by Magical Travel. And uh, you can see the world with Disney, uh, Adventures by Disney to be specific. Uh, those vacations are amazing, carefree family experiences with memories that will last a lifetime. And you can receive a free Visa gift card with any Adventures by Disney destination vacation simply by calling Magical Travel at 866-207-8387. Or you can visit them online at MagicalTravel.com to receive a free price quote. Be sure to mention Inside the Magic when you do inquire with them and uh, when you are booking your Disney vacation with magical travel and by uh, listeners and viewers like you thanks very much for your donations one time monthly recurring or uh, even clicking through those affiliate links on the website it all supports us uh, and supports the show and supports the site and everything that we do so thank you very much for all of that and now let's get started with our trip around the world <laughs> So as I said, it has been an incredibly busy week this week, uh, few, quite a few surprises, some things I was planning on doing this week, lots of things I was not planning on doing this week, as uh, at the very tail end of this week, Disney held a massive press event. Uh, they were calling it the Summer to Remember press event, in which case, uh, or in which they were going to be highlighting, and they certainly did, uh, everything that was new around Walt Disney World and beyond, as well as what's coming up next. Uh, no groundbreaking announcements were made during this event, but there was definitely quite a lot shared, quite a lot of new uh, artwork and uh, inside looks at things. Uh, there was a What's New, What's Next presentation, which is always exciting. That was Friday morning, in which uh, Disney Disney dived in, or dove into topics uh, such as uh, Test Track and what's coming up on, uh, in that ongoing refurbishment there or update. Uh, I had a chance to tour the construction site of New Fantasyland, which was really exciting. I also went over to Disney's Art of Animation Resort uh, and, and had a really extensive tour there. Again, very, very exciting. And I'll be talking more about uh, that on this week's show, as well as in the coming days and weeks, uh, both on InsideTheMagic.net as well as in upcoming podcast is just way too much to all pack into this week's show alone. In fact, I've already shared uh, a lot of it on InsideTheMagic.net, so if you want to see a lot of video and photos and reports, head on over there. But uh, the biggest sort of news, I guess, that came out of, uh, or one of the biggest bits of news that came out of the whole thing, was an updated timeline for when parts of New Fantasyland would be opening. We've sort of had a vague, unofficial timeline up until this point um, that uh, I, you know, I've been sharing all the way since the D23 Expo last year where an Imagineer shared with me the timeline at the time for when various pieces of New Fantasyland at the Magic Kingdom out here in Florida would be opening. Well, now uh, it was made official by um, Meg Crofton, who is uh, not only president of uh, Walt Disney World, but also Disneyland Paris and Disneyland uh, as well. And this was at the What's New, What's Next presentation. And she confirmed uh, that this summer, actually more specifically July of, uh, of this year, 2012, is when the Casey Jr. Splash and Soak Station will be opening within Storybook Circus uh, over at the Magic Kingdom. That's uh, similar to the Casey Jr. train in California, except this one's not going to move. It's going to be a water play area. Also opening in July will be the uh, rest of Dumbo, including the uh, indoor interactive queue area that uh, will be air conditioned. And that's definitely an important part of that. Of course, everybody's wondering what's going to be uh, going on with the Beauty and the Beast area, including the Be Our Guest restaurant and the uh, Enchanted Ta uh, Tales with Belle meet and greet and Gaston's Tavern and all of that, as well as the Little Mermaid ride. And uh, Meg Crofton was able to finally, uh, well, I don't even want to say she announced that she sort of 
again repeated that uh, the Little Mermaid ride and the entire Beauty and the Beast area of New Fantasyland will be open, as she put it, in time for the holidays of 2012. So basically by the end of the year. Unfortunately, there was nothing more specific said, uh, so you don't know if that means it's going to open in October or November or December or December 31st or what. Uh, maybe December 24th. I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. But it is going to be open this year. And then, uh, unfortunately, she also confirmed that the uh, Seven Dwarfs Mine Train is not going to open until 2014. So there's an entire year gap between uh, the majority of New Fantasyland being open and the final piece of the puzzle. Well, one of the final pieces of the puzzle, the Seven Dwarfs Mine Train. Actually, the Princess Fairy Tale Hall was uh, was not mentioned at all in regards to a, an uh, announced opening date. So we're going to have to wait and see about that bit. And, and as, a, as I said, we're going to have much more about uh, that What's New, What's Next presentation and uh, New Fantasyland and plenty more coming up later in this week's show. Now, I mentioned I did have a chance to tour Disney's Art of Animation Resort. That is not a topic I'm going to be uh, diving into on this week's show because that is a topic unto itself. I will sort of give you a quick, quick overview of, of my thoughts on this value hotel, though it is a little more pricey than your average value hotel because it uh, features uh, family suites. But the it has exceptional design that are well above and beyond any of Disney's uh, other value hotels around Walt Disney World. I toured the Finding Nemo wing and uh, sort of got a sneak preview of the Cars wing, which is still under construction, so I wasn't able to walk around there too much. I've already posted uh, preview videos and photos and uh, some Imagineer interviews over on InsideTheMagic.net, and I'll be talking more about those uh, in the coming weeks here on the show, but I'll say now that the lobby looks phenomenal. Uh, it's very colorful. Love the artwork all over it. Uh, certainly a unique style of lobby. The Finding Nemo pool area, again, phenomenal. Lots of character and uh, just so much color. And I just wanted to dive right into the pool because it was very hot out. Unfortunately, I didn't uh, get to do that. Um, the rooms are, uh, are nice rooms. They definitely sort of evoke more of a value feel uh, than the rest of the uh, hotel does. But uh, there's definitely details. Uh, everywhere, so that's kind of right. just a quick overview, a quick summary of the Art of Animation Resort. I'll be diving much deeper into that topic in the coming weeks. So here's some other news that really caught uh, everybody's attention uh, this week. In fact, it was one of the most liked, that is uh, clicking the little like button on uh, stories in a very long time on uh, InsideTheMagic.net. It was announced that Starbucks coffee is coming to Disney parks, to uh, all six United States theme parks, actually. They're going to be in the theme parks, and each of these Starbucks locations is going to be themed to match the park that it's in. The very first Starbucks location in a United States Disney park is going to be opening in June at Disney California Adventure on Buena Vista Street, which of course opens on June 15th. It's going to be inside the Fiddler, Pfeiffer, and Practical Cafe. It'll feature a 1920s theme to go with the rest of Buena Vista Street. The costumes of uh, the cast members that will be working there will tie into everything. It's not going to be like they're just plunking a Starbucks into to a park, but rather they're sort of theming and integrating a Starbucks in there. There will be a Starbucks name near the entrance, but it won't be necessarily prominently featured. Uh, menu items will include coffee, espresso, frappuccino, breakfast, and other sandwiches, pastries, and desserts. And the cups that you get there will have both a Starbucks logo and the Disney logo. And of course, those, those of you watching the video version of this see my doctored up version of the Starbucks logo featuring uh, the Little Mermaid, uh, Ariel, instead of the usual Starbucks uh, mermaid type logo but anyway you know this isn't the first time disney's had a partnership with starbucks actually overseas at disneyland paris uh, at the disney village there which is their version of downtown disney they opened up a popular starbucks location uh, back in june of 2009 this is going to be the first time disney's opening up uh, starbucks locations inside their theme parks though and many many people are very excited about it <laughs> So uh, coming up here, uh, actually, Disney this week announced a uh, start date for the summer version of the uh, nighttime show at the Magic Kingdom, The Magic, The Memories, and You. It's going to begin May 25th in this uh, new variation of the show. Of course, in the past, they did a holiday version, a romance version. Now it's a summer version, and part of this show is going to feature uh, Phineas and Ferb uh, sort of taking the helm at the beginning, turning Cinderella Castle into a giant sand castle, and then there's going to be a Hakuna Matata scene from uh, The Lion King and some other uh, fun sequences as well as the usual uh, surrounding magic memories and you show. So again, that begins May 25th. 
But coming up sooner than that at the Magic Kingdom, it looks like this whole notion of the next-gen X-Pass, FastPass Plus system is finally going to be... Uh, well, I wouldn't say rolled out, but it's going to be tested over at the Magic Kingdom beginning just in a few days. Uh, so uh, a lot of people have noticed these new sort of fast pass looking things uh, b uh, popping up at various attractions around the Magic Kingdom, including Space Mountain, Philhar Magic, Haunted Mansion, Jungle Cruise, Stitch's Great Escape, just to name a few. And uh, there's sort of two components to this. There's the uh, actual fast pass machine component and then sort of this post standing on its own with the little Mickey head logo, uh, similar to the old uh, Epcot uh, from a few weeks ago, maybe a couple months ago, when they were testing RFID entry uh, tickets into Epcot. Very similar sort of thing here. This is going to be RFID-based Fast Pass, and apparently Disney's going to be testing this notion of being able to reserve uh, rides from home at specific times, and you just kind of plunk your ticket up against the uh, RFID reader to let them know you're there, and you go right in. And uh, again, it is just testing, and it uh, means that um, not everybody's going to be able to take part. In fact, from what I've read, uh, you can't sign up, you can't ask. Disney is sort of going to be picking the people who are going to be a part of this experience. It is uh, very much in the early stages of testing. I don't anticipate Disney rolling this out uh, in its entirety anytime soon. So just, uh, just note if you see anything unusual around the Magic Kingdom in the coming couple of weeks, then uh, that is, uh, you know, around the Fast Pass area, that is what is going on. And then most likely after the test wraps up, they'll be pulling those uh, machines out, much like they did over at Epcot with the RFID um, systems there for entry. And, uh, and then it'll probably be a while before it's rolled out to the general public. So another ongoing uh, project that uh, many have wondered what the status of is, is uh, the Avatar project uh, going over to uh, Disney's Animal Kingdom, of course. And uh, an update, sort of, not really an update, but at least a mention, came in the form of a quick comment on Facebook from Avatar writer and director James Cameron alongside Avatar producer John Landau. They were actually, uh, they posted a video to uh, fans of Avatar uh, on Facebook saying they've just re uh, reached a milestone number of fans. And they briefly mentioned the fact uh, that the Avatar project is uh, working on. I actually want to share that with you now. Just uh, essentially, it's more or less a confirmation that uh, the Avatar project still exists, even though we're not really, uh, you know, we're not really hearing about it too much at this time. It still exists. So anyway, here's, uh, here's James Cameron and John Landau. Hi there. John and I are here in Beijing. Uh, we're here for the second annual Beijing International Film Festival. And we just wanted to give you guys a shout out because we just passed 30 million fans. Thank you very much to all the fans out there around the world. We're, we're very excited to continue to expand the Avatar universe and to have you take part in that. Yeah, so stay tuned because uh, there's a lot of great things happening uh, in terms of uh, at the Avatar world. Uh, we're, we're doing the, uh, the Disney uh, park, the Disneyland, and it's going to be uh, absolutely amazing. And so we'll keep you posted on all that stuff and on the uh, developments on the new movies. Thank you. So there you have it. Uh, just a just a little bit from uh, from James Cameron and John Lando, sort of casually mentioning the Disney project there. And, and I'll note that the first time I watched that, I thought, oh, James Cameron said Disneyland instead of Walt Disney World. But I think he was referring to the fact that it is a Disney. Land, as in two words, Disney and land. Not actually talking about Disneyland. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah, so Avatar still in the works, but we don't really know anything about it. So speaking of Disneyland, though, let's uh, jump coasts over to, uh, to that park over in Anaheim, where an email went out to uh, pass holders this week announcing a uh, special event, I guess you could call it, that's uh, coming up in honor of the 20th anniversary of Fantasmic for, uh, for annual pass holders on uh, Monday, May 14th, Tuesday, May 15th, Monday, May 21st, and Tuesday, May 22nd. Disneyland is holding some special after-hours uh, pass holder events from 10 p.m. till 1 a.m. with a special uh, showing of Fantasmic at 11.30 p.m. each night. To sign up for this, you don't have to have received the email. You have to just simply uh, bring your ID and your active annual passport to one of the uh, ticket windows at Disneyland in the main entrance uh, Esplanade and let them know that you're there to sign up for one of these dates and uh, they'll 
pick whichever one is still available. Of course, space is limited. Uh, Registration is closing at 10 p.m. on Thursday, May 10th. So you got a little bit of time and uh, you just sign up and then you show up and you can bring up to three guests. But they also have to be annual pass holders. Uh, there are no non pass holders being allowed. And uh, in addition to showing Fantasmic just for pass holders, they're also going to have some restaurants and shops open and available. And who knows if Disney will bring out anything special, any special guests or uh, special merchandise or gifts or anything like that. But at this time, it just seems it's a, a, a chance to enjoy Adventureland, Frontierland, and New Orleans Square until 1 a.m. in the park. So, uh, speaking of uh, late night uh, activities at Disneyland, one took place just last night over at the Carnation Plaza Gardens, and it was actually the very final night of swing dancing at uh, at that location that's been around for decades and decades, and many uh, Disney fans, uh, Disneyland fans specifically, have uh, not been thrilled about the idea that the Carnation Plaza Gardens, which is right near Sleeping Beauty Castle, is being replaced uh, by the Princess Fantasy Fair, which Disney says there'll still be a stage where there's a stage now, and there will still be uh, swing dancing at night, but it just won't be quite the same as knowing that you are happily dancing there, as uh, has been going on for decades and decades, uh, even back when Walt Disney used to uh, enjoy his own personal time there, dancing away the night, and uh, to capture all of the excitement of, uh, of last night, the final night when hundreds, literally hundreds of uh, fans showed up for this final night of swing dancing at the Carnation Plaza Gardens. Uh, Jeremiah Dawes was there. Uh, he has actually been taking part in some of the swing dancing for uh, for quite a while there, has been enjoying it, and of course he couldn't pass up the opportunity to, uh, to show up there on its final night and capture some of the atmosphere of what was going on. So I'm gonna share a bit of that uh, with you right now as well. Let's uh, let's hop on over to Disney. Disney Take back to There you go. Just a little bit of a taste of what it was like to be there last night at uh, the Carnation Plaza Gardens final swing dancing night. If you want to see uh, and hear more of that, uh, head on over to InsideTheMagic.net for uh, Jeremiah's report from that special evening. Carnation Plaza Gardens is uh, officially closing just a couple of days from now, May 1st, and then it will be uh, transformed in the coming months to Princess Fantasy Fair for Princess meet and greets and stage shows and all that kind of stuff. All right, so uh, moving on from there, uh, also talking about uh, downtown Disney, uh, or rather talking about Disneyland, but at downtown Disney uh, or not. Uh, okay, I'm reading this completely wrong. Let's start again here. Disneyland is what I'm talking about, that area, but I'm actually talking about downtown Anaheim, not downtown Disney. There lies the confusion. This comes from uh, Inside the Magic listener Ryan, actually, who's letting me know that in downtown Anaheim, not downtown Disney, there's going to be an art exhibit coming up featuring 22 artists that are uh, producing works uh, unofficially in a tribute show inspired by Disneyland. They're calling it the Rat Trap Gallery. And again, that's in downtown Anaheim's uh, Promenade Gallery, uh, Saturday, May 12th from 6 to 10 p.m. You can find out more at facebook.com slash rat trap gallery show. Again, unofficial, not downtown Disney, but downtown Anaheim. Okay, so now we'll say something that is official uh, Disney, and that is uh, D23's Faniversary event. The very first one of them was held uh, just a couple of nights ago, Friday night, uh, over at the Walt Disney Studios. There were two of them, and again, uh, I sent out uh, Jeremiah Dawes uh, to cover it for us. He'll have a complete report about the Faniversary coming up on InsideTheMagic.net in the coming days. However, uh, no video, no audio, no photos were allowed, and that's going to be consistent throughout all the Faniversary events that are happening around the country. So all I can tell you is sort of some of the highlights that he described uh, from the event. Uh, he called D23 
it, it basically is the DVD special features of the theme parks, and I think that's a good way to describe it. Uh, he's essentially calling the anniversary a chance to see sort of these extras that you don't normally get. Um, they're not, you know, necessarily the main feature, uh, but they are entertaining unto themselves. So some of the things that he saw at this uh, anniversary event was a first ride through of Pirates of the Caribbean, missing all of its skeletons uh, on video. Uh, Walt Disney walking through Old Tomorrowland as they were tearing it down. A dinner party held in the auction scene of Pirates while it was still set up at the studios before it got installed. Um, that being a scene that from the ride that uh, Walt would have actually seen complete. Uh, a bit of making of Epcot, including some miniatures of Horizon and World of Motion, an opening day Star Wars ballet for Star Tours, amongst many other things. Again, you can look for uh, Jeremiah's full report about the D23 fan anniversary coming up on the website in, uh, in a few days. And then on Friday, D23 did make an announcement of their own, and uh, that was that they're going to be helping to celebrate Epcot's 30th anniversary. Coming up on uh, September 30th, uh, there's going to be a D23 event of some sort. However, no uh, details have been released yet, so we're just going to have to wait and see exactly what that means. <laughs> So back out here to Florida, but away from the world of Disney, another big event happened this week, though it's not officially uh, had its debut yet. Universal Orlando has been running sneak previews of their new nighttime lagoon show called Universal's Cinematic Spectacular. And, uh, of course, as soon as I knew about that, uh, actually, last week I mentioned that on the show, and it was literally going on as I was recording the show. So I went to the next sneak preview, the second one, just a couple of days later, uh, because I've been really excited about seeing uh, what this show is all about and now that I've seen it I, I think it's a great show it's uh, been you know it's been compared to World of Color uh, far too much and it is definitely not World of Color it's a very different style of show the only comparison is that it has water screens and it has colorful fountains that's it it doesn't really go beyond that so in so much as World of Color was being compared to the Bellagio when that first uh, opened or debuted now this is being compared to World of Color but it really it doesn't deserve that because it is a completely different show unto itself. It's really a tribute to filmmaking and specifically a hundred years of Universal Studios filmmaking and I really really enjoyed it as a fan of movies and a lot of the films that they showed clips of in this roughly 18 minute show. I love the classic uh, cinematic uh, uh, movie moments that uh, they included in the show and it's really an immersive experience and in addition to the vibrantly uh, colored um, sort of uh, fountains that they do feature in there, as well as the uh, the mist screens, you know, the water screens. There's also plenty more to uh, to see throughout the show as well. Um, it, it, the clips on the, the, you know, the movie clips are definitely the focus of the show, but uh, there's also, you know, some fireworks and plenty others of other uh, effects that are worth noting uh, that are really just uh, take place all around you. They're not just in one straight location ahead of you uh, but really uh, even though I did post a uh, you know full 1080p video uh, HD video with binaural audio of the full show over on inside the magic.net and on our YouTube channel I do say and I emphasize that you need to go see the show in person as no video can really truly capture this full experience because it spans the entire length of the lagoon onto nearby buildings on rooftops and well into the sky all around you and it's just impossible to catch up capture all that in uh, in one video so anyway universal cinematic spectacular officially debuts on may 8th until then on select nights it is uh being uh in sneak previews and if you want to find out more head on over to inside the magic.net <laughs> And another event uh, just happened uh, a couple of days ago on Friday, which I was very busy wrapped up in all of Disney's uh, items that were going on that we're going to be talking about here in just a moment. So I haven't had a chance to go see this in person, but SeaWorld Orlando had its grand opening of the new 3D 360 attraction called Turtle Trek. And uh, that's about all I can tell you about that at this point. I do plan on visiting uh, SeaWorld very soon to experience it for myself. And when I do that, I will uh, surely write up a report over on the website all about it. But uh, this week, SeaWorld Orlando also revealed some new details about their upcoming Antarctica realm, as they're calling it, a new land, a new area for the park. And uh, within the new details and a bit of new artwork that they revealed, this world's uh, coldest theme park attraction called Empire of the Penguin apparently is going to change from visit to visit uh, to SeaWorld Orlando and to the, the, the uh, 
attraction itself, uh, it's never going to be the same experience twice. There's going to be a choice of, inten of intensities that you'll be able to pick when you ride the eight-person vehicles. And apparently, now this is not officially confirmed by SeaWorld yet, but it does look as so in the artwork, it seems it's going to be a free-roaming vehicle system that is they're not going to be confined to a single track so you're going to be sort of skating along this icy terrain following a penguin through the icy world of antarctica in very very cold weather should be interesting and should certainly be welcoming in the hot summer months and that uh, will debut next year 2013 Here's an interesting bit of news that uh, came in from Inside the Magic listener Alexa, who writes, I'm currently living in Queensland, Australia, and there's something I think you may want to hear about that's currently going on around the rumor mill here down under. It's being said by many real estate agents and town council that there has been uh, many different large plots of land in the Narang South Port area on the Go uh, Gold Coast being purchased by anonymous Disney shareholders, much like they did when creating Disney World. It is said that it will be called Disney Down Under and supposedly have construction starting during late 2013, early 2014. Well, uh, certainly an interesting rumor there. I don't know that we can take uh, too much uh, of it uh, as fact, but it would. I know Disney Down Under as a concept has been uh, floating around out there for a few years now. Would certainly be exciting for Disney to expand to Australia uh, as a new, whether it's a theme park or a different kind of experience, or maybe even just an Adventures by Disney sort of thing, although they wouldn't need to buy up land for that, but uh, it's worth paying attention to and see if anything comes of that in the coming year. So thanks very much, Alexa. In the world of merchandise this week, those of you looking forward to Disney Pixar's next film, Brave, you can now purchase items from Brave over at Disney Store Online, as well as uh, in the Disney Store at the mall. Actually, earlier today, I was just at uh, the Florida Mall out here in Orlando and saw all the Brave stuff for sale. Apparently, the bow and arrow set uh, for uh, that goes with the Merida costume is very, very popular and sold out there. It's, a, of course, a suction cup arrow, not a real arrow, but there's the big bright red wig and shiny green dress and plenty of plush items and dolls and all that kind of stuff. And speaking of uh, Brave, let's uh, actually move into the world of movies here for a bit. Uh, this week in Las Vegas was an event called CinemaCon, and Disney was there in a big way, had a lot of big news to announce, but in addition to the news, which I'll get to in just a second, it also uh, offered attendees there at CinemaCon a first-ever chance to meet and greet with Merida, the uh, princess star of the upcoming film Brave. Uh, she was there as a uh, face character with, the, again, her red curly hair and green shimmery dress in front of a promotional backdrop for the film, and uh, it's assumed that this is more or less what the character is going to look like when uh, she makes her way to uh, Disneyland and the Magic Kingdom sometime in just a couple of weeks. She's supposed to debut there in mid-May. <laughs> So uh, as far as the news that was announced at CinemaCon, some pretty exciting things. Uh, Disney uh, dove a little bit into uh, some things that we already knew about, which was the sequel uh, to Monsters, Inc., which is called Monsters University, as well as some discussion about the upcoming films Frankenweenie uh, and uh, Oz the Great and Powerful with some in-person appearances there at CinemaCon by directors Tim Burton and Sam, uh, Sam Raimi, respectively. But the real announcements uh, came when Disney finally confirmed Confirmed a sequel to The Muppets, tentatively titled The Muppets 2, which may or may not ultimately be the name of the film. Kermit the Frog and Miss Piggy were there on stage to announce that as a firm movie, definitely in the works, which everybody more or less knew that it was going to happen, but it is official now. In addition, uh, Disney and Pixar announced that Toy Story 3 director Lee Unkridge is working on a film about the Mexican holiday of Dia de los Muertos, which I find to be fascinating. I'm really, uh, really looking forward to what that film's going to be all about. There is no additional information. There's no title. There's no plot. There's no anything. But, uh, you know, I'm obviously a fan of anything sort of semi-spooky and skeletons and all that good stuff. And so uh, if Pixar is making a movie about Dia de los Muertos, which is Day of the Dead, um, uh, I'm excited. So I'm really looking forward to that. Of course, Lee Unkridge did a great job with Toy Story 3, so that should be really good. Also, uh, in addition to that, at CinemaCon, uh, Disney elaborated on something we already knew about, which was back at the D23 Expo during the Walt Disney Studios presentation. Uh, they had announced that Pixar was working on a dinosaur-related film. Well, that film now has a title. It's called The Good Dinosaur, and the synopsis of that film is as follows. 
What if the cataclysmic asteroid that forever changed life on Earth actually missed the planet completely and giant dinosaurs never became extinct? This hilarious, heartfelt, and original tale is directed by pa uh, Bob Peterson, who is the co-director and writer for Up and writer for Finding Nemo and the voice of characters like uh, Doug in Up and Roz in Monsters, Inc. and Mr. Ray in Finding Nemo. Anyway, and it'll be produced by uh, John Walker of The Incredibles and The Iron Giant. The Good Dinosaur will be released on May 30th of 2014 from Disney and Pixar. And one other update, uh, back at the D23 Expo, uh, they also uh, hinted at an untitled Pixar movie that takes you inside the mind of a person, and that film still does not have a title, but it does have a little bit more information now. The film is described as Pixar takes audiences on... Uh, sorry, I just lost my place. Here it is. Pixar takes audiences on incredible journeys into extraordinary worlds from the darkest depths of the ocean to the top of the Tapui Mountains. I'm sure I pronounced that wrong in South America. From the fictional metropolis of uh, Monstropolis to a futuristic fantasy of outer space. From director Pete Doctor of Up and Monsters, Inc. and producer Jonas Rivera of Up, this inventive new film will take you to a place that everyone knows but no one has ever seen. The world inside the human mind. Yeah, that was quite a mouthful uh, just to get basically to the point where this movie is going to take you inside the mind. Not much else to say there, uh, but sounds like that'll be fun as well. One final bit of news that came out of CinemaCon was that a musician Jack White, uh, formerly of the White Stripes, is going to be writing, producing, and performing the score for the upcoming Walt Disney Pictures and Jerry Bruckheimer Films film, The Lone Ranger, starring uh, Army Hammer and Johnny Depp. And that's going to be coming out May 31st, 2013. One more bit of news about uh, Brave. Uh, it was announced this week that Brave is actually going to become the first film to be uh, screened or at least tested using the new Dolby Atmos audio platform. This is a, you know, a replacement in the long line of many different sort of Dolby digital surround sound systems that have been used in theaters and home theaters and all of that. Dolby Atmos is the latest one. It involves speakers being able to be individually programmable so you can place sounds anywhere in the sound spectrum, including having speakers on theater ceilings, which is very new. So uh, Brave is going to be the first one to take advantage of that where applicable. And back to the topic of the Lone Ranger. Uh, ever since the uh, image of Johnny Depp as Tonto came out and everybody's been wondering why in the world is Johnny Depp wearing a bird on his head as Tonto? Well, uh, Depp revealed his uh, inspiration this week for having that bird on his head. He was quoted as saying... I'd actually seen a painting by artist named Kirby Sattler and looked at the face of this warrior and thought, that's it. The stripes down the face and across the eyes, it seemed to me like you could almost see the separate sections of the individual. And it just so happened Sattler had painted a bird flying directly behind the warrior's head. It looked to me like it was sitting on top. I thought, Tonto's got a bird on his head. It's his spirit guide in a way. It's dead to others, but it's not dead to him. It's very much alive. So, uh, yeah, so there you go. That's why Johnny Depp is going to be wearing a bird on his head while playing Tonto. And uh, continuing with the world of movies coming out this week from uh, Disney being distributed by Disney and from Marvel is Marvel's The Avengers. And I saw a sneak preview of it just a couple of days ago. Unfortunately, I am not able to give you my review of it just yet. Uh, that is, uh, I'm being forced to hold that until Wednesday. So look for that on May 2nd on InsideTheMagic.net. I'll talk about it on next week's show as well. Uh, what I can say is that it was uh, a movie you definitely should go see. And I'll leave it at that for now because that's all I'm allowed to say. And uh, other movies uh, not in theaters but uh, coming home was announced this week. And uh, as if Disney didn't have enough problems with John Carter already... Uh, they've announced that John Carter's going to be coming home to Blu-ray, Blu-ray 3D, and DVD, and all that good stuff on June 5th. And they released the cover art for the Blu-ray, and uh, I must say it's not the most attractive cover art I've ever seen for a release. Uh, whoever was responsible for marketing John Carter must have had, had a hand in designing this artwork, because it's not great but anyway it's coming out june 5th uh, the movie is actually quite good uh regardless of its poor box office uh, performance and uh everything else anyway uh cinderella diamond edition is also going to be uh also was announced as coming out on blu-ray that's going to be a while away though october 2nd 
And finally, some TV listings from Kirby over at Bartlett-Sloan.net slash TV. And it's simply one listing for a little over a week from now on Wednesday, May 9th. Uh, if you remember just a few weeks ago, uh, Modern Family, ABC's uh, hit comedy, was filming an episode at Disneyland. And that episode is going to uh, be aired on ABC on May 9th. So DVR it or watch it or whatever you need to do. And that's it for your news from around the world this week. Before we get to this week's tip, I do want to reiterate what uh, somebody in the chat room just said. Joe Ludwig uh, said, if you liked John Carter, support director Andrew Stanton and buy it on Blu-ray. And I wholeheartedly agree. While the movie did not do well at the box office, I actually really enjoyed it. And uh, I'm sure it will be just as good of a movie on Blu-ray as it was in the theaters. And uh, yeah, so there it is. Anyway, let's get to this week's tip for today. And it comes in from Joseph, who actually has a uh, pre uh, preface to his tip in response to some recent uh, emails sort of back and forth that's been about uh, projections and digital projections and film and Epcot and all that. Joseph writes, call me a geek, but I really love the exchange of technology professionals who have been writing in lately. Uh, maybe this will encourage other tech heads to write in and give their two cents about their Disney experiences. And so, uh, yeah, that's good. I've enjoyed it as well. Hopefully we'll... Uh, We'll talk about some more tech stuff in the world of Disney here on the show in the future. But now let's get to his tip of the day or of the week. Joseph writes, let Disney handle your luggage. I know Disney's Magical Express is a contracted arrangement with Mir's shuttle service in the Orlando area, but they definitely have really thoughtful Disney customer service people involved. I was so pleased on my recent, pleased on my recent uh, vacation uh, to Walt Disney World to be able to check my bag in Minneapolis and have it magically appear in my hotel room at uh, my Disney Resort Hotel. Disney provides you in advance with luggage tags to alert their people in Orlando to collect your bags for you. Better still, at the end of my stay uh, was when Disney printed up my boarding passes for the trip home after my wonderful vacation and gave me simple instructions as to how my luggage could be checked through from the hotel. All I needed to do was go through security and walk onto my plane, letting Disney and Disney Magical Express handle my luggage and take me to and from the airport made the whole vacation so much more relaxing and enjoyable. I can't recommend this service enough. Joseph, uh, thanks very much for that tip. I have never had a chance actually to use Magical Express. I uh, obviously live here in Orlando and there is no such thing uh, as that in California, but those who uh, do take a lot of luggage, maybe because you're buying a lot of merchandise like I always tend to do, uh, definitely a good way to not have that extra hassle, that extra headache of dealing with it yourself. Everyone else out there, email your tips into tips at insidethemagic.net. Now we have a lot more really exciting news to get to this week from recent day's events. But before we dive into all of that, I want to put in a quick word about Theme Park Connection. Uh, ThemeParkConnection.com is their website. And when you visit that, not only can you visit their eBay store online in which they are selling hundreds of uh, Disney items rare, common, everything in between. Uh, you can bid on it. You can buy it. And uh, it's a wonderful place to just browse through if you are a Disney collector. But in addition to that, their website is also where you will be able to find uh, directions and store hours for their physical store out here in Winter Garden, Florida, which is just about 15, 20 minutes north of the Magic Kingdom. And you can go there and see these items in person and uh, touch them and pick them up and look at them and buy them and walk out the door with them. They are uh, very rare, often uh, items, posters, uh, products. Uh, things you just can't get anywhere else that are from the Disney parks and Disney movies and beyond. Uh, really exciting stuff uh, if you are a Disney collector. So again, check it out over at ThemeParkConnection.com. So it's most definitely no secret that uh, I try to use some Tron music here on the show whenever possible. And I have a, a pretty good reason for doing so this week because uh, this week 
just a, a couple of days ago. Disney revealed, at least in part, what they are doing to test track over at Epcot, and I am uh, I am more than excited about it. Now, no, it's not a Tron ride, but it's probably about as close to a Tron motif, a, t- a Tron uh, design elements that we can expect. A very futuristic version of Test Track is on the way, and it's uh, really uh, focusing away from the old sort of gritty, realistic view of what it's like to test cars and moving on into the uh, world of designing cars in a computer. And uh, Disney plans to immerse guests visiting Test Track into this design world, this digital world, this virtual world, uh, and really sort of give you a chance to experience what it would be like to step inside a computer and, uh, and, and ride through all these different aspects of design as represented by lots of glowing colors and shiny lights and things that look very, very Tron, though are not officially Tron at all, which I think is, uh, is fine. At least it's, uh, it's something very different than what was at Test Track before. But don't take my word for it. I've actually got a couple of interviews uh, here for you. Uh, in fact, if I wanted to find out more about Test Track and what is going on over at Epcot, these uh, two people uh, are absolutely the perfect people to talk to. First, I want to uh, share with you an interview I did just a couple of days ago with the assistant project manager for the ongoing Test Track update. Her name is Melissa Jesselnik. She works for Walt Disney Imagineering, of course, and she can kind of give you the overview insight of what exactly is going on over at Epcot and uh, let you know exactly what you can expect when Test Track reopens a bit later this year. Test track clearly uh, clearly closed uh, very recently, and everybody's been very excited to find out what is coming to the future of Test Track. Can you tell me a little bit about what we can expect? Sure. Um, We're reimagining the story of Test Track, kind of bringing it into the the digital world of design, where before the attraction focused on kind of the physical testing of the attraction, we're taking that into the new realm of of design that takes place inside a computer. So you'll start out as a, a Chevrolet designer in the design studios. You'll go to kiosks where you'll be able to design your own vehicle based on a number of different attributes that we're focusing on in the attraction. Then that design will follow you into the ride itself, where you'll see how it stacks up against the different tests that vehicles go under. And then that design will follow you through still further into the post-show, where you'll have an opportunity to see how your vehicle is stacked up against other guests, um, play with it in, in a couple of different other digital environments, and even get your picture taken with a digital version of your car in a physical environment. So what everybody's really curious about is how much of this sort of sim car notion that has been uh, sort of thrown out there is going to be really seen on your vehicle or are you going to see a lot of computer screens or, you know, how is that actually going to work? Sure. Well, there's a lot that's very physical about the attraction. If you've experienced the attraction, you know, you know, we go through a lot of different scenarios where you're going through high speed turns, you're experiencing different kinds of kinds of um, cornering experiences, going through environmental chambers those kinds of experiences fundamentally will remain the same. We're just moving them more into the digital space. So you'll still have that same physical dynamic taking place with the high speed around the exterior of the vehicle or of the building, but you'll be able to see how your design stacks up against our test track vehicle. So that's where the sim track piece of it comes in. So the scenery around the existing track is going to be completely different than what people have known as Test Track for many years. Absolutely. We're really immersing you in the digital realm, bringing you into that design space and seeing what your vehicle inside a computer, what those kinds of tests might be, as opposed to the more physical, uh, physical attributes. Design has evolved so much, you know, in the last few years, and computers are such a big part of how we design everything, both cars and, you know, our attractions at Walt Disney Imagineering. So we really wanted to focus on that aspect. It's so exciting, you know, lots of really cool glowy imagery um, that will really make you feel like you're inside a computer. It's going to be a great experience. Looking at this artwork here behind you, um, certainly looks like silhouettes of people walking around touching things. Is this sort of the queue atmosphere? Yes, both the queue and the post show will be very interactive. Lots of things to touch and feel and see um, all around that that design space. Um, very, you know, very digital. You'll have a computer kiosk that you're working at, and you're able to manipulate your design in a lot of different ways, both making selections as well as 
impacting the design actually on these designer kiosks that, that we're putting in. So lots of touch points, lots of cool things for the guests to experience. And then once you get on the ride, it's still just a, a ride. You're not going to have to poke buttons and move things around. You're just going to sit back and enjoy. We certainly want you to, to just, you know, stay in your car. Uh, you know, you always see the, the keep your arms, hands, feet, and legs inside the vehicle. So nothing about that will, will be changing. Um, but yes, we want you to enjoy the experience. We'll, we'll display the images for you as you go through so you'll understand, you know, your design and then be able to, to play with it further in the post show. And was it uh, Walt Disney Imagineering's idea or did Chevrolet approach you? What was the reason for sort of having this makeover of Test Track? Yeah, it's certainly a great partnership. You know, we're always looking for ways to um, to reimagine our stories. Um, because design has evolved so much, we've got a lot of new stories to tell within the, the automotive design um, world. And so that was certainly a big driver behind it. You know, Chevrolet is always looking to keep their, their image fresh, their brands fresh. Um, so it turned out to be a great partnership. They're able to showcase the new design things that they've been working on we're going to have you know things that people have never seen before about Chevrolet design in our in our building so it's really a great partnership their design certainly has a big fingerprint on what we're doing but it will certainly have the Disney Imagineering touch to it as well and what's the time frame for the reopening of Test Track um, we're looking for uh, for later uh, this year so vague time frame at the moment very absolutely <laughs> So there you go, uh, Assistant Project Manager on this Test Track update, Melissa Jesselnick. But I wanted to find out more, so I talked to show producer, for, also from Walt Disney Imagineering, Trevor Bryan. Now, Trevor has uh, a long history with Walt Disney Imagineering. You may uh, recognize some of the projects that he's worked on. He was the Dimensional Designer and Field Art Director for Horizons at Epcot. He also was a concept designer for Mannequins at Pleasure Island. He aided in the creation of the Indiana Jones uh, Enhanced Ride Vehicle, also managed design and development of new fireworks launch technologies and worked on the alien encounter attraction including some theater uh, special effects and the actual alien experience so uh, well versed in the ways of creating excellent Disney uh, attractions and experiences and I'm really excited to uh, what he's bringing to the table here uh, for the test track update at Epcot so let's hear what he had to say as well Take me a little bit back to the origins of the decision to sort of overhaul Test Track. Why did it happen, and what's the direction you're now going with the attraction? Well, we were we were in conversations. Uh, you know, G General Motors has got a long relationship with Disney and with Epcot. Uh, they've been there since the day Epcot opened. Um, and there's, like any other industry, you know, the automotive industry has evolved. So. Um, through the evolution of the automotive industry, Test Track has changed over the years. Not before Test Track, it was World of Motion, and that, that early uh, concept that when Epcot opened. So Test Track was another change in the automotive industry. It represented a lot of automotive safety issues, which were big on people's minds at the time, and that's what the, the, um, uh, the concept then really represented. Today, I think we're more about automotive design and what the future is for cars and, and uh, you know, the whole transportation industry. So that relationship between Disney, General Motors, Chevrolet evolved, and that's where we are today. Okay. So clearly, from the artwork behind you, a very different experience is on the way in Test Track, a very futuristic, you know, Tomorrowland kind of look. What is the, the inspiration behind this sort of digital aspect versus the very real, gritty version that's been there for, for so many years? Well, as we got into the design process and, and what that really represents, we realized that we had to represent that in an interactive way to just travel through exhibits and see what that is would not really be an engaging experience for our guests. So we started thinking about an interactive, and as, of course, the, the most obvious way to interact in that process is to do it with a computer. And as we evolved that design concept that you would design a car, we thought, well, what if you experience that design that you've created in a virtual or simulated track environment? So we're not trying to take guests out, you know, you travel through a warehouse when you go through this attraction. That's what exists there now. So what we're doing is we're representing those kinds of simulated environments that you would travel through if you were in a computer kind of gaming experience or computer design experience. I mean, the first thing that I see when I look at this, and I said it to you earlier, is Tron comes to mind, and I, you know, already seeing others say the same thing. Was that an inspiration for this look at all? 
Well, you know, Tr Tron represents being in the computer gaming environment. Our attraction represents being in the computer simulation environment. So it's hard not to have a visual connection with that. And Tron is a great Disney film and a great property. And, you know, it's, it's hard not to look at that great art that inspired Tron and not capture some of that in our design. But it's not Tron track. It is still test track. And Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It is test track. Yeah, so now these uh, little icons over here, is that part of what the uh, interactive queue portion is going to be? Yes, we, we have our guests designed to four attributes. Those attributes are capability, which represents off-road handling and also extreme weather conditions. Um, we have them designed to efficiency, fuel efficiency, what's your carbon footprint of your car. We have them designed to responsiveness, which is how well your car um, uh, performs on, on the uh, winding roads or road handling capability. And then finally power, which is how fast you, does your car go, or if you're designing a truck, how much could it haul? So those are various design requirements as you go through that interactive experience that you'll take through and test on in the ride itself. And how does that testing actually happen? Is the ride itself going to be affected by what is chosen in the queue, or is that really just built into sort of that score element that's going to come at the end? It's a scoring part of the, the attraction. Guests will receive scoring as they go through the ride and then in the post-show as well. So the actual physical nature of the ride will not change based on what's inputted in the queue. To all our fans out there of Test Track, we are not <laughs> changing that ride experience um, in, in the dynamics of the ride and, and how the, the fact that it is a thrill ride at Epcot. So just a, an updated version, very digital, very contemporary look. Absolutely, that's, that's a great way to, to say it. And uh, one more question, as you're going through, uh, you said it's sort of a warehouse experience, and it has been, is it still going to have that open air feel as you're going through it, or are you going to feel a little bit more enclosed into individual show scenes as you're well, going through? I think it very much will have that open air uh, kind of feel to it, um, but with some very dramatic displays as you go through there that I think will be quite different. And we're, and we're looking to see it uh, sometime at the end of the year? Yes. Fall, okay, this year, we're working very hard to get it done. <laughs>So there you have it, a bit more about uh, what's coming to Test Track in Future World at Epcot. Certainly a more futuristic uh, experience than what has been there for so many years. One that I'm definitely looking forward to, to add a few more notes that I uh, found out about that were not uh, in those interviews. The experience is basically going to work as such. Uh, it's uh, going to, you're going to walk up and you're going to enter into this new version of Test Track and throughout the queue you're going to be uh, essentially walking uh, around uh, various sort of touch screen experiences and as uh, as Trevor Bryant said there you'll be able to choose uh, various elements from uh, four different categories as you walk through that will go into your vehicle design and then those elements will uh, then in turn be scored against the experience that is already there that is the track itself and the ride itself is not going to change based on what you input but rather what you input is going to be scored against the ride and its experiences so basically you're trying to um, develop a um, you know sort of a uh, I guess a design for a car through whatever this interface they have is uh, that will work well through the uh, twists and turns that exist already in Test Track. And those thrills, the high-speed outside area and the twists and the bumps and all of that sort of thing will remain as part of the Test Track experiences. Now, all this is going to take place by handing guests as they're walking through the queues. You're going to carry a card with you, and it is presumably RFID. You're going to, uh, you know, uh, tap it up to the various displays that you're working on, take that information with you, and then while you're on the ride, that information is going to be carried with you from scene to scene and will uh, be reflected somehow, whether it's uh, on the screens in the cars or maybe screens around you, and you'll be scored as you go through. From what I understand, those who are taking the fast pass option will have a design just sort of given to them. You won't have to design your own because you're not going through the regular queue and you'll just enjoy the ride experience itself. Then when you move on to the post-show area, you then can take your information further if you designed one and interact with more uh, experiences there. So that is sort of the new flow 
of, uh, of what Test Track is. What is not known at this point are exactly what that means and what the show scenes are going to be and exactly how it's all going to work. The artwork that is shown off looks fantastic. It's it's clearly Tron inspired from blues and reds and this sort of digital lightning coming down from the sky and lasers. And uh, if you just saw this artwork by itself, you would think that's a Tron ride, but it's not. It's Test Track. Um, and that's fine with me. I'm, I'm obviously uh, a big Tron fan, and I would love to see a Tron ride come to Disney, but if that's not going to happen, then this is the closest and next best thing. Uh, but specifically, what are these scenes that are uh, shown off in the released concept art? That's not really being said at this point as to exactly what's going to be going on uh, during these, how the animation is going to work and how the colors and the lighting and everything happen. And I did also overhear that there will be some more surprises that uh, Imagineering is simply not willing or ready to let um, be available or, uh, you know, make available quite yet. So there's a little bit more than what we know about what's coming to Test Track. But uh, but as it is, there there's at least an opportunity to know a bit about what the new Test Track experience will be like. Uh, and it's going to be reopening sometime later this year. Uh, the Walt Disney World uh, online calendar scenes seems to suggest that it'll be opening around December 1st or so, uh, simply because uh, Disney has, um, you know, basically said Test Track on the calendar will be closed through the end of November. But uh, in asking the Imagineers, they don't know that for sure. They're very much at work, uh, hard at work on it. It could open sooner, could open later. They're simply saying fall of this year at this point. And I do still have uh, some more exciting news to share from this week's events, uh, moving away from Epcot to another park around Walt Disney World. But before we get to that, let me put in a quick word about Lanyard Lab. This is uh, what I do when I'm away from Inside the Magic. I run lanyardlab.com, and it is there that you can go if you're in need of custom lanyards for promotional use. Maybe you need a business that you're looking to get the word out there around, or if you're around a school or a church or any organization where you need to wear name tags or ID cards around your neck, uh, you can customize it all over at lanyardlab.com fill out our price quote request form and once you submit that to us with all your details and design elements we'll email you back with a uh, price quote for your design along with a proof showing you what it'll look like when put together as a lanyard you can order online it's free to try and as easy as that so check it out over at lanyardlab.com <laughs> So another big topic this week was updating everybody on what is going on around New Fantasyland. And on hand for both of the days of the Summer to Remember media event was Walt Disney Imagineer and creative director for New Fantasyland, Chris Beatty. And uh, he took me on a tour through Storybook Circus, uh, kind of uh, divulging the backstory and the details of the areas that are currently open to guests, as well as uh, what is to come. Uh, when the rest of it opens in July. Also had a chance to step behind the construction wall of New Fantasyland, take a peek around there, and have a little bit of Q&A with Chris Beatty as well. And then the following day, he was also there at the What's New, What's Next presentation to share even more details and uh, more artwork uh, and, and uh, all that good stuff for New Fantasyland. So now I want to share a whole lot more with you beginning with our trip over in Storybook Circus. If you uh, remember a few weeks ago, then uh, you know we sort of uh, talked about, or I talked about Storybook Circus, and I of course posted uh, plenty of video and photos online about um, about how all that worked, uh, or rather how all that was designed and put together and uh, appears in the park. But uh, you don't necessarily get all the details by walking through uh, for sure. So it's great to have somebody uh, like Chris Beatty take you through the area to really give you a, uh, a full look at exactly what it is all about. So now let's step over to the Magic Kingdom to hear from the Elf what Storybook Circus truly is. So um, let me give you just a quick, uh, let me give you just a quick sort of little explanation of the circus and a backstory on the circus. So as we enter the circus and we pass through the main marquee, which is not up yet, but it will be arriving shortly, um, you've entered into Carrollwood Park. And that park is a small park on the edge of an old circuit, uh, old train line, um, somewhere in the Midwest. It's the 1940s, early 1950s is the era that you'll be stepping into. And I'm 
sure all of you know about the history of the Carrollwood Park and the, you know, the relationship to, um, to trains and you know, Walt Disney. That was his train line. It was in his backyard. Um, so when you go through the land, you'll see little glimpses of a CP or the Carrollwood Park logo. Um, that is our little tip of the hat to Walt and his toy train that was in the backyard. Um, so Carrollwood Park is the setting. Uh, Casey Jr. has brought the circus to town. He's dropped off um, you know, Dumbo. Uh, he's set up a couple other attractions that we'll talk about. Um, but Dumbo really is the star of the show in the circus. So you'll see him with all of the gilding and the sculpting, and he really sets up the tone for the environment that you're ready to step into. So let's walk down. We'll take a look at Dumbo, Barnstormer, and the new train station. So a couple things about Fantasyland. Um, you know, we are doubling the size of Fantasyland physically. Uh, so this is um, it is quite an honor to get to do this. It's not every day that we get to work on a Fantasyland uh, within one of our castle parks. Um, I think it, the real treat here is I think just the amazing detail uh, that you're going to see. Um, just in the paving, you know, the other story. We tried to put storytelling into everything we do. That's one of our traits as Imagineers. If you look at the paving, we even hit peanuts. They're not real peanuts. Don't freak out. Um, but there are um, peanuts even hidden here in the. Uh, hardscape of the area development. You'll see animal tracks that help support that story about the circus coming to town. And like I said, Dumbo really is the star of the show. So the back in the backdrop of the big top here, you can see Dumbo the flying elephant. A um, couple great things about Dumbo. You know, we uh, we brightened the color palette a lot, tried to give it more of that 1950s era kind of look. Um, a lot of great hidden details in Dumbo. If you look closely at the top, you'll see the stork delivering the little Dumbo. Um, you know, to Mrs. Jumbo. Mrs. Jumbo is just below. She's looking proudly at her son flying around the circus. And then some of the details, if you really look closely, the, what look like those gold filigree elements are really elephant trunks, and they're holding peanuts, and they're holding feathers. So there's a lot of double reeds that we work to, you know, to hide in, in the uh, ornamentation of the attraction. Um, probably one of my favorite elements is down around the bottom are eight illustrations that we had commissioned that tell the story of Dumbo, beautifully done in the style of the film um, by uh, an artist from Feature Animation. So, um, you know, we tried to add a lot more color. Uh, the music, you know, sets a great tone for, for the placemaking, but we're very proud to have our first Dumbo online, and in the near future, you'll see Dumbo number two um, uh, come online as well. So, so this is our circus. This is the first stop in the circus. Now let's go down. We'll look at uh, Barnstormer. Is Dumbo number two going to be a mirror image of Dumbo number one? Exactly, exactly mirrored dumb version of Dumbo number one. Yeah. You know, the story of Barnstormer featuring the great Goofini. Um, you know, all the circus, the circus always has its stars. Like I said, Dumbo is the star of the storybook circus. So you always have your B acts, right? So Goofy is sort of the tag along of the circus. He's not the big star that Dumbo is. So when you see everything carved and beautiful for Dumbo and this pristine paint, eh, Goofy's barely keeping it together over here in his act. He is the stuntman of the circus. He does all kinds of acts. He, he jumps over sharks. He wrestles bear. He juggles tigers over Niagara Falls. It just so happens that today, the day you are here, he is performing his aerial acrobatics and the barnstormer. So you get the board, the little plane here, go up the lift hill and take off on a high flying adventure through the sky. Um, he's not such a great pilot. He does run through the billboard. He runs through the lift tower. Um, but this is a great rite of passage coaster for our younger guests, uh, our families. Uh, we're really, really happy with it. But this is Barnstormer featuring the great Goofini. And there's some great details. As we walk by and look at the train station, look up the queue. You'll see his rocket from his rocket gag um, or his rocket stunt um, where he straps himself to a rocket and tries to shoot himself into the air. There's even a cannon that looks like he just shot himself across the path and through the target over here to the Wow. So, some great detail up the queue and storytelling as part of Barnstorm. Let's walk down, we'll take a look at the train station. Carrollwood Park at the very beginning of the tour. If you look up on the clock here, you can see this. That was the Walt logo from his old rail line. Um, so it sort of sets the tone for the train station. This is the Fantasyland station. This is where you will enter in to board the Walt Disney World Railroad. You see the train pulled up here, as we're here right now, um, taking on passengers. Um, so this is a working station here in, in the front. But in the back, uh, coupled with the train station, is uh, our set of restrooms, which are designed to look like an old roundhouse. This is important because you can see in the paving of the area development, there are a couple spur lines that have come in off the main line of the railroad. This will look like when we're finished that Casey has brought the train in here off the spur line and he's resting while the circus unloads. Um, it looks like he can turn on the wood table and go right back out the line, connect into the Walt Disney World Railroad and take off.
off to the next little town down the road. So the roundhouse, uh, believe it or not, we even have tracks inside the restrooms. Um, so it looks like the trains can be parked right at night and pulled into the uh, to the roundhouse and be put away or worked on. Uh, but some great theming here. You can see that 1930s era style uh, brick, Midwest kind of brick, um, really sets the tone in a great backdrop for uh, for the circus coming to this little little town on the edge of uh, on the edge of the rail line. And there's a bit about Storybook Circus. Uh, not uh, all uh, information that we didn't already know, but certainly great to hear uh, from Imagineer Chris Beatty, who's in charge of uh, making it all happen together. Next up, we're going to take a uh, trip over behind the construction wall of New Fantasyland to learn more about what is being created there. Understanding what it would be like about right here today, um, right in front of the entrance, believe it or not, to the Seven Dwarfs Mine Train that you see in front of you. So let me just kind of walk you around the site real quick. As you can see here, this is the castle wall. Very important for storytelling. Um, uh, this really defines or divides the two spaces. The castle courtyard, which is very regal and it's festive and in that tournament tent kind of feel, uh, that you know, that sort of uh, Renaissance fair feel. But as you step through the wall, there's a dramatic change in just the finish and, and the, uh, um, the texture and the color palette and the storytelling that you'll find within the forest. It wants to be a little older. It's, you know, even the castle wall will be carved two different ways. One side is very pristine and kept up. The back side, a little more rugged. You know, it's, it's taken the weather and it's taken the, you know, the age of the castle shows. But this castle wall will be look just like it was built day one with Cinderella's castle, like it's always been here. You can see the spires starting to take form here and the main entrance in. From this direction going into the courtyard, it will frame the carousel. But coming out this direction into the forest, it really frames the Seven Dwarfs Mine Coaster. So we come through here, you have the mine coaster, which will be the centerpiece of the expansion when we're finished. You can see the Seven Dwarfs Cottage here. Um, this is, of course, is a terrain following coaster. You don't see big steel sticking up out of the ground. Although right now today you can see the brown steel, which is our ride steel, and the grade steel, which is our facility steel. So that will give you uh, a good idea of how high the, you know, the, the mountain will be when we're finished. It'll be a little taller than this. Everyone asks, will you be able to see um, Prince Eric's castle when we're done? No, and that's intentional. Um, just like Disneyland, one of the things I love about Disneyland is that reveal, those reveals you get as you turn a corner in that park, the sight lines open up another destination that pulls you to it. We're trying to get a lot of that DNA into this park where as I come through the castle wall, I find myself going up the main path here, which is the bridge you see in front of you, and the castle was revealed to me. So this is the Seven Dwarfs Mine Coaster in the foreground. In the back, you can see our second major attraction. This is uh, Under the Sea, Journey of the Little Mermaid. We're almost finished with the castle back there. You'll see the scaffolding start to come down the next few weeks. Um, but a lot of beautiful detail work here that's done. That is the entrance to the attraction. You'll go down into the grottos, board the vehicles, and go on that great journey under the sea that celebrates all the songs from the film um, with our cast of characters. Off to the left here, you can see the little village is you can see Gaston's Tavern, and then to the right, Bonjour Gifts. Uh, Gaston's Tavern does not serve alcohol. I uh, always get asked that question. Uh, but it is a snack facility where you can go in, get out of that hot Florida sun, have a great uh, ice cold beverage, um, sit down, and it's themed tons of antlers. I always say the team found things made with antlers that I never even knew existed. Um, we couldn't even use all of them. Um, so it's going to have that great spirit. You know, Gaston's spirit will be well represented there. Uh, there's a great portrait of him up on the wall, all with antlers around it and a fireplace below. It'll be a lot of fun. The Little Bonjour gift shop is, of course, a, a little bit of a, you know, a version of the book bookshop from the beginning of the film, from Beauty and the Beast. And then, not out there yet, but you can see in the illustration, there's a great statue of Gaston that will be coming out front. Um, it was built by Gaston, given to the village in honor of Gaston. Um, it's kind of conceited, you know, it's very much in Gaston's nature. The bridge here, um, this bridge you can see there is starting to take shape that leads us to the Beast Castle here in the mountains, um, is starting to form. Guests will be able to cross this bridge and enter into Be Our Guest. This is our, our main restaurant or dining experience as part of the expansion. Um, three rooms in here that you'll get to dine in. One is the main ballroom. You'll also get to dine in the West Wing, which was sort of the forbidden room where the rose is. Uh, the rose will be found. There's a great special effect of the rose in there. And then uh, finally, there's a gallery space that the, you'll be able to dine into as well, dine in as well. Um, this is the Beast Castle. It is not Bell's Castle. It is a little foreboding when you cross that bridge. It's a little foreboding when you enter. Um, 
You can see the rock work. We even carved the rock work with a sharp and angular, almost like if you touched it, it would cut you. Um, it was intentional because it's supposed to be, you know, the castle as it was enchanted, not after Bell arrived. So, uh, and there is sort of, believe it or not, a little bit of a transformation moment that will happen as you walk through um, that space. And then finally here on our left, um, this is Maurice's cottage and Belle's cottage. Guests will get to travel through the little woods, enter in, and this is the entrance to our storybook adventure. Uh, this is a brand new way for our guests to get to interact with our characters. Um, we really wanted to take what is their traditional meet and greet and take that to a brand new level. Um, so it's more experiential, it's more um, immersive, it's more personalized. Um, there's some great magic moments that will happen in here um, before you even get to meet Belle. Um, so this is what I call one of our storybook adventures. Um, it is going to be a fantastic, fantastic show uh, when we're done. Is this going to be a slow reveal or is it going to all be open at the same time? We're actually still working out through the, the timing in regards oh, okay. to the phasing coming in. All right. We haven't announced anything. Okay. To clarify, the restaurant's going to be in the castle. The castle is going to be. Yes, yeah, so you dine inside the castle. In the ballroom, the west wing, and a gallery space. Um, I wish we could, you know, if we. We're able to go inside. The detail is spectacular. It's everything you would expect if you walked into that restaurant in the film. Um, from the, the ballroom is just exquisite. So we're really excited to get guests in that space. Um, you know, it's. I think um, it will be a, a definitely a destination. I think within the park when we're done. Beautifully detailed inside. Can you talk a little bit about this uh, this waterway that's sort of passing under the bridge? Yeah, I didn't mention it, but if you look at that, there's a, a V that's in the mountain up there. Um, one of the things that we really tried, you know, the, one of the great things about this expansion is I think the overs and unders is what I call it. There's bridges with water that goes underneath us, and there's grade changes. There's a waterfall that comes out of the top of the mountain that falls probably 30 feet down and into a basin. That water finds its way underneath both of these bridges and comes around and connects into the mine coaster site. There are five waterfalls that come off the face of Little Mermaid. So you're seeing it right now with no vegetation and no water yet. This facade will soften uh, dramatically when we uh, bring all the effects online. So water, it's very cooling, especially in Florida, that's important. Uh, it was one of the things that was high on our you know, priority list as we designed the expansion, guest comfort. We kept coming back to guest comfort. You know, we want guests to be able to come here, sit down underneath a tree and just people watch, you know. It's one of the great things about Disneyland. Uh, you know, it's a, if, if you didn't ride anything, it's a pleasant place to be in. It's a park-like setting. Um, that was one of the, the, the spirit of that is what we tried to capture with the expansion. Uh, you call it Fantasyland Forest, so where is the majority of the foliage that we're going to see? You're, I mean, you can see the illustration here. Right. There'll be big trees, a lot of aged trees. I think, you know, if you look at, if you go back down to the circus and mm -hmm. you look at some of the planting that's begun down there, that, that'll give you a sense of the lushness, I think, when we're done, that this space will have. Um, a lot of big old character trees, trees with, you know, trees that have a story to them. Um, you know, that landscape is so important to really, I think, uh, you know, tell the story about where we're traveling to in a time and place. That same amount of detail will happen in here. Um, even throughout the year, the trees that we've picked and the planting will transform the spaces. Uh, you know, will bloom at a certain time or bloom with certain colors. There's some beautiful pink trees that will be coming in the spring in front of Bell um, that we're really, really excited about. So, uh, uh, as you can see in the illustration, lots and lots of vegetation. So much, much more about uh, New Fantasyland from Imagineer Chris Beatty. I had a wonderful time uh, walking through, well, barely walking through. I kind of just stood on the other side of the, uh, of the construction wall there, but it was great to get my first look standing in the middle of New Fantasyland and being able to look left and straight and to the right and just look all the way around and see what will ultimately become uh, new fantasy land and, and understand the scope and the scale and, and uh, what struck me the most of standing back behind that construction wall was uh, being able to see the ups and the downs and the, the, the you know grade variations of the land uh, the waterways and that's why I asked him about that because that's what I'm really looking forward to most sure there's gonna be a seven dwarfs mine coaster which is gonna be exciting there's gonna be all these new experiences be our guest restaurant the little mermaid ride but I'm looking forward to just enjoying the atmosphere and I was really happy to hear that that is a huge part of what New Fantasyland is going to be is sort of evoking that same feeling that you get out of Disneyland today that you can just hang out you can just sit back relax enjoy your time there and you don't have to be writing something or meeting a character or going to a show you can just enjoy 
being there and uh, the shade produced by the forest and the relaxing uh, atmosphere with the waterways and the bridges and the waterfalls, which I'm really excited about uh, as well, should make an incredible uh, environment, just as Storybook Circus is a huge improvement over what used to be there, of course, Mickey's Toontown Fair. Um, so I'm really, really looking forward to seeing all of that develop in the coming months and uh, the majority of it being open by the end of this year. But believe it or not, there are even still more details that Disney revealed over the last few days. You heard a question get asked there during that uh, New Fantasyland tour about opening dates. And at the time, this was Thursday afternoon, they didn't have anything to reveal. Of course, it was the following day at the What's Next, uh, What's New, What's Next presentation that uh, President uh, Meg Crofton uh, was able to reveal a, a more concrete time frame about all of that. Plus, Chris Beatty came back to the stage to talk even more about what is coming to each of those areas, including uh, a bit of an update on Princess uh, Fairy Tale Hall, which we've heard very, very little about. So as one final feature here on this week's show, I want to take you over to actually Disney's Coronado Springs Resort, where this presentation was held, to hear a bit more about New Fantasyland. Our two new castles, Prince Eric's Castle and Beast Castle, and both contain outstanding family experiences. Prince Eric's castle crowns under the sea the voyage of the Little Mermaid. And inside Beast's castle, you can dine in his enchanted ballroom in Be Our Guest restaurant. And I'm pleased to announce today two new dates for Fantasyland. The Dumbo pre-ride experience and Casey Jr. Splash and Soap Station will open in July and Be Our Guest restaurant and Little Mermaid, along with Bonjour Village Gifts and Bell's Cottage, will open in time for the holidays later this year. But there will still be more to come. The Seven Dwarfs Mine Train is scheduled to open in 2014. I'd like you to see the new and expanded Fantasyland through the eyes of one of our visionaries who created it. Please welcome Walt Disney Imagineering Senior Creative Director, Chris Beatty. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so I'm really excited to be here to take you through the Fantasyland expansion. A uh, couple things I want to really focus on in this presentation. One is just the scale of this project. Uh, some of you got to peek and go through the wall yet, or through the uh, construction fence yesterday, and, and uh, got to kind of see it, and you know, without the wall kind of breaking your, your vision. And the scale is just enormous. We are literally doubling the size of Fantasyland. And you can see here by this illustration, or by the aerial photo, um, you know, you have the uh, carousel, it's right sort of in the upper left middle there by the blue wall. Look at the size of, of, of this project. It is enormous. It runs all the way down to the Walt Disney World Railroad line, um, clear down here in the bottom right corner. It is huge. Um, and it's very, very exciting. Um, the other thing I really want to talk about is just immersive storytelling. How, like you can see the uh, conceptual rendering here of Belle's Cottage, that journey that our guests will get to take through the woods as they make their approach to this charming little cottage nestled in the woods. And, well, you can see in the photo down here to the right how we're bringing that to life. And it always amazes me to see the concept rendering we did two years ago, and then when you get in the field, how close we really come to, to visioning that. Um, so there's some fantastic details outside and inside this um, this attraction. Well, of course, um, you know, how do we make a giant beast castle look like it's a mile away, you know, up into the mountains with the snow? Well, we do that with a lot of forced perspective. It's one of the great illusions that Imagineers uses uh, to uh, bring our attractions to life. And of course, you can see here, this study is the beast castle nestled up into the rock work. Uh, the rock work is very sharp and angular. It has the, you know, takes on the presence of the beast or the personality of the beast. And then you can see here the construction photos of the castle actually up with the rock work in front of it. And the more and more we layer, we put the trees in and more rock work, um, that forced perspective will come to life and you'll really get a sense of traveling up into those cold mountains um, to go into the Be Our Guest restaurant. Of course, we have the little village from uh, Beauty and the Beast. This is where you'll find Gaston's Tavern. You'll find uh, the little bookshop or the merchandise shop from the film. 
And, but the centerpiece or the heart of this space really is uh, the a statue of Gaston and LeFou. Uh, this is a statue that Gaston has made. Uh, he has given it to the village in honor of himself. So it's in, uh, in very uh, uh, fa you know, Gaston fashion, uh, very conceited. And it's really funny, you know, he's using LeFou as sort of his footstool as his kegs of ale are, are spraying water everywhere because they've, uh, they've been shot holes in. Uh, it should be really, really charming and fun. Under the Sea Journey of the Little Mermaid, if you watch that film, there's very, that castle is in that film just for a brief moment. So when we sat down, we started looking at, well, what's the front door of this attraction? Where do we want to take our guests? Where do they want to journey to? Well, we actually went back and met with the, some of the animators from the film. And we talked about the detail and the storytelling, what that castle would look like. And then slowly from those meetings, we started concept renders, as you can see up here in the left-hand corner. And then after that, of course, we started construction. This is spectacular. The scale of it, the presence of it as the front door uh, to Under the Sea Journey of the Little Mermaid is just going to be, um, uh, it's going to be a, just a, a very magical moment as our guests pass through. Uh, one of my favorite attractions within the park, within the Magic Kingdom, of course, is Dumbo. I, I love Dumbo. Um, we, of course, as Meg mentioned, we are doubling Dumbo. Um, it will be a beautiful circus setting that, uh, that will be the backdrop for Dumbo. But I think uh, if you really go out and you look at this attraction, and the one on the left is open, uh, you'll see some amazing detail in the elephants and in just the, the centerpiece of the elephants fly around. We hit all kinds of little magical moments uh, uh, within the spinner, and it's just going to be it's going to be a great, great attraction for years to come. Of course, what circus would be complete without Casey Jr.? Uh, Casey has brought the circus to town. He's come in on the rail line. He's unloaded all these wagons full of monkeys and elephants and giraffes and camels. And, and uh, this is going to be an incredible water play area um, for families. Uh, kids are going to love it because the monkeys are spraying water hoses and elephants are squirting you. And Casey himself has some great water features. Um, it's really going to be a lot of fun. You can see the photo down here. Uh, this was just from two days, three days ago um, during installation. So we're getting very close, very close. Uh, barnstormer. Well, uh, every circus has a stuntman, uh, and of course, Goofy is our star stuntman for this circus. Um, he will take our guests on this aerial acrobatic ride through the clouds. Um, of course, in classic Goofy fashion, he is not a great pilot, so he has run through the tower, he has run through the billboard, um, um, and of course, we get to uh, join him in this fun adventure. Uh, when we are done with the expansion, uh, our princesses will have a permanent home in the castle, uh, in the courtyard area. And I think this is going to be just an incredible space for our guests to enter into. Um, it will be carved in, you know, in its, in, with all the beauty of a castle setting, beautiful portraits up on the wall, a very regal, very royal, uh, very fitting for, um, for, their, uh, for their presence here. So this will be a permanent home for our princesses. And then the Seven Horse Mine Train. Um, this amazes me. I talked about the scale of this project. This is a great example. The concept rendering up to the left is coming through the castle wall, and you can see the mermaid castle just barely peeking over the, uh, the, the trees behind. Well, the foreground is the cottage, and that mountain where the train is coming out, believe it or not, if you look at the photo, that's what the steel is representing. The brown steel is the rhyme steel, and the gray steel is our structural steel. So you're seeing exactly taken from the same angle, the photo, and how the, we're bringing that illustration to life. But it is a huge, huge sight. Uh, the coaster has a great presence. It really will be the centerpiece of the expansion when we're finished. And next, um, so, We've shared, a lot of times we share with you the outsides of the building and, and what the facades might look like and the storytelling of entering into these attractions. Uh, we really haven't shared a whole lot of what's inside. Um, I have a little treat for you. We haven't shown anyone this yet. Um, we're going to show you a little video of um, the chandelier that's being placed inside Be Our Guest. There are three chandeliers. Um, the main chandelier in the middle is 11 feet wide, 12 feet tall. Um, and then the other two are um, designed a little bit smaller. These were ex almost exact replicas of what was in the film that Bell and Beast dance under. And this space is so immersive. Every time I walk in there, I, you are transported to that moment in the film where Beast and Bell dance around that ballroom. It is going to be exquisite and spectacular. Um, I can't wait for everyone to come in and enjoy it. Um, it's just going to be a, um, a very magical, magical moment when we open the restaurant.
So there you have it. Uh, between the tour of Storybook Circus, the behind-the-scenes look uh, behind the construction wall of New Fantasyland, and even more artwork details and other information shared, as well as a updated uh, opening timeline this uh, the past couple of days really set the stage for everything that is yet to come in New Fantasyland. Of course, there are still plenty of surprises and plenty of uh, details and uh, inside looks that we have yet to see as it all unfolds and unveils over the next few months and even couple of years, reaching all the way out to 2014 for the Seven Dwarfs Mine Train Coaster. But uh, definitely very, very exciting uh, of it all. As I said, I'm most excited just to be there, just to experience it all you know a water play area Casey Jr. man maybe not so much a fan of that for me but for young kids uh, will certainly be exciting there the Seven Dwarfs Mine Train Coaster should be really exciting I love the Little Mermaid ride out in California can't wait to see the uh, uh, more or less the same version out here in Florida though with an improved uh, approach with Prince Eric's Castle and uh, the queue uh, in Ariel's Grotto and all of that should be very very exciting and the whole Beauty and the Beast area while Beauty and the Beast is definitely not my favorite uh, Disney film I think the uh, immersive environment they're creating particularly with the Be Our Guest restaurant should be really exciting and any chance uh, Disney can add a, uh, an additional restaurant, uh, especially a table service at night with Beauty and the Beast uh, is a good thing in my opinion because I don't think the Magic Kingdom has nearly enough of that type of uh, dining experience. So if you want to see even more uh, from all of that head on over to InsideTheMagic.net with, uh, with more photos and of course complete versions of those videos as well, especially for those of you not watching the video version of the show but rather uh, listening to the audio uh, podcast you can see some behind the scenes uh, video and photos and all those goodies and uh, yeah new fantasy land moving right along very very excited it's going to be a couple of months before we get uh, the next glimpse at something new but uh, looking forward to it That's where we're going to wrap up show 369 of Inside the Magic. I have a very, very large amount of listener feedback to get to, but we're at almost an hour and a half into the show, and uh, we'll just kind of stop here for the moment, and I'll uh, save it for next week's show. Next week, I have uh, many more topics, actually the next couple of weeks, many more topics to dive into, including Disney's Art of Animation Resort, which uh, opens its first wing at the end of May, but I've already had a chance to look all the way through it and have so much to say about it. Uh, I've already shared a lot of it over on the website, so if you want to see that now, uh, visit InsideTheMagic.net to see video and photos throughout Disney's Art of Animation Resort, but stay tuned for uh, sort of my report on uh, what I thought of all of that. In addition, I'm going to have some updates it's about uh, Agent P's World Showcase Adventure with some interviews related to that, as well as uh, an interview related to Splitsville, the upcoming uh, bowling alley slash restaurant slash entertainment venue with some very interesting details uh, that is to come as well as uh, as other things as, uh, in addition. So lots to share in the coming weeks, in addition to all of the other special events that will be uh, occurring as we get closer and closer to the big June 15th date out in California uh, for uh, uh, Cars Land and Buena Vista Street and all that good stuff. So uh, lots to look forward to. Just keep uh, tuning in here to Inside the Magic and uh, on the website as well to stay on top of it. Of course, I do want to thank Magical Travel for sponsoring this week's episode of Inside the Magic. You can always find out more about their travel services by visiting MagicalTravel.com. Also visit ThemeParkConnection.com not only to browse their online store uh, where you can buy some great Disney collectibles, but also find out how you can visit them in person in their physical store uh, out here in Florida to see those items for yourself. And you can actually sell your own stuff to them as well. Uh, of course, visit us over at LanyardLab.com to see all the different styles and custom lanyard options that we have available. You can request a uh, price quote today to receive a free digital preview of your lanyard design. Once again, our website is InsideTheMagic.net. It is your source for Disney and theme park news. Great uh, place to find the links to follow us on Twitter and Facebook and YouTube and get all of the uh, latest up-to-the-minute updates that way. So, uh, once again, thanks to all of you for listening and for watching each and every week. Have a magical week. Day. Goodbye. There's a great big beautiful tomorrow. Just a dream.